Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, or if you have the notes, grab those. And uh, we've emailed them out. If you'd like to get an email of those notes weekly, just please let us know your email address. Go to our website. You'll find my email. Just email it to me, and we'll get you on there. But we have begun the book of Ephesians last week. And uh, as Paul has begun this letter, it's a call to Christians to now possess and continue to possess all that we have in Christ. We saw in the first two verses last week, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints, that's all of us that God has declared righteous, who are in Ephesus or Calvary Chapel, Los Alamitos, are faithful in Christ. What is it to be faithful? Remember in John, they said, what do we do the work, the works of God? And Jesus said, there is one work, believe on him whom God has sent. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, Christ considered me faithful. <laughs> With the insinuation in there that in our flesh we are never perfectly faithful. But God takes our willingness and our faith as faithfulness. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We did a message on grace and after that, we comes the peace, and we're going to continue to talk about that word, grace. It's the gospel of grace. The final word in the entire Bible is now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Now, as we start verse 3 today, we need to understand that in the original, it's one continuous sentence all the way through verse 14. And so in the Greek language, it's just one giant sentence penned by Paul talking about the past, the present, the future, God's master plan, Christ's blueprint of election, election from the past, his redemption in the present, and his inheritance in us in the future. It starts out in verse 3 through 6, focusing on the Father and then it goes in 6, 11, 6 through verse 11, the Son. And then in verse 13 and 14, the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul is going to take us on a journey to a very throne room of God where Jesus Christ is seated in the heavenly places. What is the surprise is when we get to that throne room, we're sitting there with him. And so there are some remarkable ways right now we are in heaven with Jesus right now. We were with him in his death on the cross. We were with him in his resurrection. And now we are with him or in him as he is seated. So are we in heavenly places. Well, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember when Mary met Jesus after he raised from the dead. He said, no longer touch me because I have not yet ascended to my God and your God, to my Father and to your Father. Speaking as one in human flesh, he was submitted to the Father. He said, the Father is greater than I, referring to authority only, not in substance. We have one God, only one God. The Lord our God is one Lord. But like all of creation, we're not surprised since God made this place, everything is also in threes, as he himself is in a, a triune God. And so Paul begins to say, in the triunity of God, there are things that the Father does alone. There are things that the Son does alone. There are things that the Holy Spirit does alone. When we look at creation, we'll see God the Father, we see God the Son, and we can see all, God the Holy Spirit, all three in the very first chapter of Genesis. In the resurrection, Jesus said, I will raise myself up. In Acts 8, it says the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And then in several places, it speaks of the Father raising Christ from the dead. All three 
were participants in that as well. But we are going to look here in Ephesians and see these three separate persons of the Trinity and how they are touching our life, giving us great security in Christ. And so he says, let's first stop whatever we're doing and worship God the Father. Of course, we can immediately say, God so loves us. The Father so loves us. He sent his only begotten son, right? That it's the Father really is the one who gave his son that we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life. Boy, this is going to continue throughout the book of Ephesians. In verse 17 and 18 of chapter 1, he's going to say, And the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. There it is. We can praise the Father because right now, this moment, he's given us wisdom and revelation of himself and of the Son. That the eyes of our understanding enlighten, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Thank you, Father, for giving us understanding and enlightenment. Thank you, Father, for your calling, for your inheritance, for your power for that mighty power that's working in us right now. In Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, he says that, and the Father has raised us up together with his son Jesus and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he, the Father, might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Interesting that we would get the grace, but we would see the continuous, infinite kindness of God towards us. I really think the word love that we use today no longer is a word that has any meaning. But when you look at 1 1 Corinthians 13, I think kindness is one of the main elements within love. And I think Kindness really does cause people to feel loved. And God is continually kind towards us every single day. And it's going to take an eternity to realize that the grace has brought us the kindness of God infinitely. Well, he has blessed us singular. So there's one giant continuous blessing. And it's in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. All these earthly blessings, they come and they go, and they're so temporary. Our life is just a vapor. If God said, I'm going to give you an inheritance, all of it now while you're alive on earth. Anybody feel cheated? (laughs) It would be like this. I'm a billionaire, and I say to you, I'm going to give you a billion dollars for one second. Okay, and I look at my banker, and I say, give him a billion dollars and take it back in one second. You're a billionaire, you're not a billionaire. How was it being a billionaire? It's irrelevant, right? So God is making it clear. The place... If we understand time, if we understand our life on earth being just a vapor, then we want all our blessings to be eternal. And this is what the Bible says, that God would ordain us and then he would bless us and that all the works we do would be eternal works. The fruit that we bear in the spirit, by the spirit, those works would last for eternity. So remember, when you share one verse with somebody or you tell them God loves them, you plant a seed or water a seed or you sit and say, can I read six verses to you out of the Romans road? 
and share a little bed. Those are eternal seeds. That's an eternal weight of glory. When we have a chance to, for, to do good works and men to see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. He's going to say it five times in this book, heavenly places. So it makes it clear it's not just in heaven, but even on earth in the heavenly places, the eternal weight of glory that can happen with us even in these sinful bodies. He has blessed us in the past with all blessings. Do you understand what that means? God front-loaded it all. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm going to give you a few blessings and I'm going to see how you live. I'm going to see if you're worthy of the next allotment of blessings. And then if you don't have too many, you know, downhill slides and you're mostly on top and you're mostly obeying rather than disobeying and you're not lusting and being too mean or greedy, then, then I'll, I'll, you know, trickle a few more blessings your way. God is making it abundantly clear that all his blessings are coming to us by grace. We don't deserve it. It's unmerited. We're not going to earn it. And your weakness, your failures, your sins, your struggles while in this human flesh are going to also continually be met by God's blessings and kindnesses. And we know that. Isn't it true in Romans 2? It's God's loving kindness and tender mercies that bring us to repentance, isn't it? Some of those times when we're going through our worst sinful moments, this wave of blessing hits us. And we know it's from heavenly places. It's not from this earth. It's not dumb luck. It's God having blessed us before the world began. And those waves are hitting us and reminding us you're already seated together with him in heavenly places. An author by the name of Weiss says this, the expression is a large one, covering all the good that comes to us by grace, whether the assurance of immortality, the promise of the resurrection, the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, the privilege of adoption, etc. Paul, in this moment, is writing this letter from a cell in prison in Rome. It's been about 25 years since his conversion. And in his 25 years of ministering has been nothing but continuous trials, beatings, imprisonments, shipwrecks, being defamed even by people saying they're preaching the gospel. How are you hearing this message today? So often, People are in a place where they're saying, you know, if God is so good and loving, how do you explain my trials right now? My troubles, my sorrows, my pain. Where are those blessings? Some might say, why is my life littered with frustration and depression? If God has front loaded all these blessings, where are they? Well, in this passage, we discover the source of our blessing in the Father and the character of the blessing. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So whatever trial we're in, God has a spiritual blessing in every trial, right? We know that from James 1. Rejoice ahead of time, knowing that the end result of that trial is going to cause us to eventually be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Wow. God's got a... Pretty aggressive plan for us until we are perfected before him. And so we need to remember all of eternity, all of heaven, from that eternal heavenly perspective and power, no matter what comes our way, we have already been blessed for a lifetime as a gift not that we deserve it, not that we earn it. 
And so this is why the prophet Isaiah in 54 verse 17 can say, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. We can also rest secure in a very well-known verse of Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good, not for everybody on earth, just those that God's front-loaded spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But for us, it says here that God, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we're going to discover in a second that that calling and purpose comes before the foundation of the world. In Romans 8, 1 and 32, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with us all also freely give us all things? It, it's the formula of greater to the lesser. We realize now in those heavenly blessings that God gave his only begotten son to come into human flesh for 33 years, which is hard enough. But then he died being tortured, paying for our sins and rose again. If we realize that that is one of the blessings that God's given us before time began in heavenly places, what would be greater than that? Well, my sins are, it's nothing's greater than that. Your sins have already been paid for in Christ. Whatever you're experiencing is lesser than that. And if God was willing to give you that great of a blessing, he's going to now be freely giving you all blessings. In Romans 8, 37, this is just right after he said, we are like the sheep to the slaughter all day long. And then he said, yet in Romans 8, 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? How? through him who loved us, not by our obedience, not by our faithfulness, not by our commitment, but because he's already in the past blessed us with all spiritual blessings, holding back none for us. And then, of course, this phrase, get used to it. In Christ in the Son, in the Beloved. This is a little couple of words, but it is really the heartbeat of Ephesians. It's all this comes because of Christ. And we are in Christ. Remember John 17, Father, as I am in you, and you are in me, that they would be in us, and we in them, in a perfect unity. That God never sees us outside Jesus. Every time the Father looks at us right now, He looks through the prism of Jesus and then to us. And as He looks at Jesus' righteousness, He sees that we have been declared righteous as Christ is righteous. And so it's a simple little phrase in Christ. But it's the heart of Paul's theology here in Ephesians. Christ is the center. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is the knowledge of God. We cannot bypass Jesus and find God. We cannot obtain spiritual blessings apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, in every sense of the word, is our mediator. Jesus and in Christ alone is our safety, our salvation, our protection, our peace. Our response to these being blessed with all of these heavenly blessings in Christ. Simply to just curl up and to abide in his arms like a baby sheep in the arms of a shepherd. Like a little toddler in the arms of a of dad, like a brother, a big brother who's grabs you and
gives you that big hug and walks with an arm around you. And in verse 4, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So this is to do exactly what it does, blows our mind. That's what it's supposed to do. We're, we're to look at this and go, yes, Christ chose us, you know, right after I said, Lord, I'm a sinner, be the Lord of my life, and then he chose us. No, that's not the way it worked. I, I love that example of there's a door, and on the front of the door it says, whoever will come, let him come and enter through Christ. And we open that door and we walk in and then we shut the door. And on the other side of the door, it says, I know you've been coming since the foundations of the world. <laughs> Welcome, Brian. I knew you would enter here. And I wrote this before time began. We are to try to understand and to get it. Yes, we choose Christ, but it's such a small thing in light of the fact that God chose us before the first click on a clock, before he said, let there be light, before there was an earth, before there was any space, probably before there were any angels. It was God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit alone in fellowship, in love, in light, in perfection. And then before God started creating things, God seeing the past, the present, and the future equally saw us through time and saw us a billion, zillion years from now in heaven, seated with us, learning of his grace growing and understanding of how much he loves us and how rich is his kindness towards us. And so, very simply, God knew that we were going to come. And he has already planned the way, not only that he would be our Savior, but that we would be holy without blame before him in love. He sees us standing before him, before the Father, holy, without blame, white as snow, without any blemish, without any wrinkle. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't it take away all striving? Doesn't it take away all fear? I, I said this last week, and I'm going to say it several more times. The whole point of Christianity is not like any other religion. All other religions instill a guilt, a shame, a fear, a fear of rejection, a fear of not being good enough, a fear of not doing enough. And they keep instilling and people, whether they admit it or not, are doing things God wants them to do because they don't want to get blackballed. They don't want to get rejected. And, and, and they're trying to make up and earn some of that forgiveness back. They're trying to earn some of God's love and acceptance by their deeds. And the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13 makes it clear. If it's not of love, it means nothing. It accomplishes nothing. There is to be only one motive and that is in a place of faith, which is rest, which is security, which is certainty. That says, God's already seen me holy. And now, out of love for him, I want to join him in that process and be holy as well. But I'm not doing it out of fear. I'm not doing it out of guilt. I'm not doing it because God may, you know, fall short and I got to add my... 10%. No, he's going to get it done. But love says, I want to serve you. I want to bless you. I don't know if everybody's at this place in their marriage. 
but I love serving my wife. When she needs something, my heart just is full of joy to be able to get it for her, to do it for her. And honestly, it's just because she so serves me. She so loves me. And I'm always trying to think of ways I could bless her. It's not because I'm afraid she's going to divorce me. Or I'm going to afraid she's not going to let me sleep in the same bed as her. It's not because I'm afraid that she's going to take off and, and say, good riddance, you bum. There's, there's zero fear in my relationship. It's out of love. And this is where God has to crush all other motives. Well, but Brian, you tell everybody they're right with God, even if they go to church, nobody will show up next week. You know what? If somebody's got to, to wrestle with this, if, they're, if, they, if they say, wow, I can go out and sin, and where sin abounds, grace abounds more, I guess I'll go sin. If that's what's in your heart, that's what's in your heart. That, that would be like somebody saying, I'll never divorce you. I'll, I'll love you. I'll always be a faithful friend to you forever. And so you take your cowboy boots and step on their toe until it breaks. Why would you do such a thing? Wouldn't somebody saying, I'll stand by you, be your best friend, I'll be loyal to you and love you to the end? Doesn't that bring in you to say, I make the same commitment to you? I, I, I felt that to a degree, but after hearing your expressions and your words and, and the abundance of your friendship towards me at a level I had not yet contemplated, but after hearing that, I, my level of friendship to you wants to match your fr level of friendship to me. Your loyalty to me, I want to match that loyalty to you. That, that extension of your hand to walk with me the rest of my life on earth. Man, you don't find people like this every day. I want to match that. And it's out of appreciation for you thinking I'm worthy of your friendship. But see, that's, that's normal. When you're seeking God because you love him, no fear. When you're reading your Bible just to learn how you could love him more. That is Christianity. Catholics are terrified. They're doing all the stuff they're doing to try to earn God's favor and try to get God to, to not be so mad at them this week. And every time something bad goes wrong, they, they get a flat tire. Oh, God, forgive me. They burn the stake. God, I know that you're telling me I'm a horrible person and I couldn't, I got to quit sinning like that. that that's, that's where they're living. That's like all other religions. That's like the Muslims trying to pray five times a day and trying to wear this and wear that and say this and do this because they're trying to reach God and they know they're failing. That's why in the radical Islam, the jihad is so hopeful to them because if I murder a bunch of infidels and die myself, that's that alone. Allah, no matter what kind of day he's having, can't reject me. You see, you could be a perfect Muslim and Allah wakes up one day and has a, oh man, I'm just grumpy today. Everybody that was planning on going to he heaven, all of you are going to hell. It's just the will of Allah. They, they know that he's a fickle guy like that. And it totally makes sense to them that he would be fickle. And so they try to be the best Muslim they can. And just so happens the day they die is the day that Allah has a bad day and nobody's making it. That's, that's sort of the other extreme, isn't it? But yet, with, even with all denominations of Protestantism, the pastor will sort of talk two-faced. Will tell you it's all by grace. It's all by the work of God. But if you're not obeying to this level, you probably were never saved to begin with. Ah, I got to make sure I'm saved. Okay, I'll start doing all the stuff I'm supposed to do. 
because I want to make sure I am one of the elect, so I got to get busy. No, that doctrine of Calvinism is horrible. Calvin did not get it right. The man was a murderer. He murdered people that disagreed with him. And his five points of Calvinism, which people interpret very, very differently, it is not the way, it is not the glasses you put on to understand the Bible. Now, I love the Calvinists. I think they have some great books and great points on a few things. But unfortunately, their doctrine of perseverance of the saints says, you're never the elect unless you keep obeying. And if you go through a season of not obeying, the first check on your list should be saying, was I ever elect to begin with? And they honestly can't tell you if they're going to heaven until after they die to find out whether they were ever the elect to begin with. It's, it's not a gospel that brings joy. In 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul says this again to young Timothy, who has saved us and called us by this holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before time began. This is literally vanishing point to vanishing point. God, in essence, is saying, in the past vanishing point, I can think of a billion years, I can think of a trillion years, and then whoosh, vanishing point. In the future, <laughs> a million years, a billion years, a trillion years, whoosh, vanishing point. God is saying from vanishing point to vanishing point, he has called you. And it's a holy, sanctified calling, not according to your works. Our, another translation actually says it this way, not by your performance. I like that better. Not by your performance. God has called you with his holy calling, not because of your past performance or present performance or future performance but it was something that's totally known in God alone. God has in himself a purpose. God in himself has a grace that he wants to pour upon you. It's all found again in Christ Jesus. And it's not something we can ever know. It's something that only an eternal God can know, but he wants to blow our minds by saying this thought is there. God didn't choose you when you were five years old going, hey, I think this guy's got some promise. No. Matter of fact, I love what Spurgeon says on that. If God hadn't chosen me before the foundations of the world, he wouldn't have chose me now. Or he wouldn't have chosen me after I was born for sure. Spurgeon said, oh God, choose all the elect and then elect some more. <laughs> What's he saying in those things? He, he's saying, we can't get it. We can hypothesize about it. But we cannot ourselves do anything infinitely. We can't make a plan before time began. Only God can do that. We can't look a zillion years in the future. Only God can do that. But if you're here today and you say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is my Messiah, Savior. Saved from what? I'm a sinner. That's a key. To say you simply believe in Jesus, well, for what reason? Well, I'm an American. <laughs> I was raised Catholic, so I believe in Jesus. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Jehovah Witness. I'm a... No, you need a savior. I believe Jesus is my savior. And here's the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. That's the extent of it. If you say yes to that, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he was buried and after three days he rose again. 
then you are saved. Nothing more. You have been called before the foundations of the world. There's a great debate going on about election and predestination and people struggle and say, did God choose me or did I choose him? Or, you know, is, don't I have to choose him before he can choose me? And, oh, you know, I'll just simply ask the question. Does one choice make the other choice irrelevant? I don't think so. We, we find both in the Bible. In Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then the next thing we discover in John 15, 16, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you. You should go and bear fruit, your fruit which you remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. We see again in John 6, 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life, whoever. But then in John 6, 44, before that he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. But on the other hand, <laughs> Revelation twenty two seventeen says, the spirit and the bride says, come, let him who hears come. Let him who thirsts come. Let him who desires, let him who take the water of life freely. But on the other hand, in John 1, verse 12 and 13, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. But listen how emphatic verse 13 is. Who were born, are we sever in John 3, 16, or in John chapter 3, to be born again? Not of blood. You can't will it in your kids. Not of the will of the flesh. Man can't will it for himself or others. Nor of the will of man, but of God. It couldn't be more emphatic. That if you have chosen God, it's because he had first chose you. The doctrine of election looms large in the book of Ephesians. We come to God on God's terms. Our coming is no accident. God knows our nature, our need, and still chooses us before the foundation of the world. Our salvation has been carefully planned by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. People get messed up with the word holy. It doesn't mean a a superior, intrinsically better than others type attitude. That self-righteous prudish that we saw in those horrible Pharisees that looked down their nose at everyone. What does it mean to be holy? It's talking about a uniqueness in God's character, his nature. And Adam and Eve originally were made in that nature. We are made in that nature. But what do we read in Genesis 5? That Adam, it says first that Adam was made by God in the image of God. But then in Genesis 5, and it says, and all Adam's sons came from Adam. That sinful nature we inherited. But nevertheless, even though Adam and Eve messed it up, we are called once again to walk in that unique nature, that kindness, that love. We have the power of God's spirit to deny our sinful flesh and its cravings and serve our fellow man with a deeper, more giving way. That's the motive, you see. The, the motive of being holy is not so I feel better about myself. When I walk holy, I feel more holy. That's why I do it, because I like that feeling of holiness. I, I fear that I'm not quite being accepted by God. And when I'm walking holy, it puts that fear away. And plus, it's sort of my backup plan in case believing in Jesus only doesn't work. I, I do have a back pocket full of good works to show God. It's not a holiness where men run off to some monastery and concentrate on being holy. I'm going to live in a cave. I'm not going to eat anything sweet. I'm going to be in you know, sackcloth, a gunny sack. I'm not going to see any women. I'm not going to talk at all. And as I live in that monastery away from all worldly temptations, I shall be holy as long as I stay in the monastery and keep denying myself. How horrible. 
No, our desire to be holy as God is holy is that we can bless, we can be blessed, and we can be a blessing. That we can have greater fruit and God would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So you got to understand, when God saves us, at the same time, when we have justification, works of righteousness are built into that justification. What is the good works of God in our life? It's called sanctification. One day, we will be in heaven 100% sanctified. But right now, we are walking in a process where without us, he won't, but with us, he will. In Hebrews 10, 14, for by the one offering he has perfected forever, justified, just as if you never sinned, holy and righteous, you're saved. Through the one offering of Christ, he's perfected forever those who are now being sanctified, those who are being sanctified. Justification has built within justification good work, sanctification. In James 2, 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So if a person says they bought a brand new Corvette, and yet you see him come to church every Sunday on a bicycle, and you're like, hey, didn't you buy a new car? And a year goes by and you never see that Corvette. At some point, you start wondering whether or not they have a Corvette, right? In the same way, somebody who has the Holy Spirit come into them, we're going to see a life that has the Holy Spirit in them. It's not something we're doing to earn our salvation or tuck fears away that God's Spirit's not in me. It's a real thing. God is a real person. Although we don't see him now because we're in this human flesh, we will see him one day face to face and very, very soon. But his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God Almighty lives in us, comes into our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. How? In your whole spirit, soul, and body to be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why we're on earth. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So God is at work to make us the most fruitful we can be. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us is speaking to our spirit. Yes, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yes, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I try to love people and end up cursing them, I know. This, this is why we need the Holy Spirit, that he would bless us, and then through the Holy Spirit, we would be a blessing. And all Christians rejoice in that, because that's the Holy Spirit in them wanting such a thing. John Phillips writes, God saves us, sanctifies us, and sees no blemish in us. All of this is done in love. All of this happens, we're going to learn next week, by God's good pleasure. We live in the world marked by rejection. Most of us experience some form of rejection in our lives. Rejection by strangers, our friends, our family. Sometimes we don't make the team. <laughs> Sometimes we don't get the promotion. God right here is trying to say, whatever pains and sufferings that you bring upon yourself or man brings upon you or Satan brings upon you, I accept you. <laughs> I am working in you. Those who have the Holy Spirit in them want to walk even as he walked. And God is saying that is going to happen. Everything that happens in your life, everything is working towards that purpose. And so in the midst of trials, we take joy saying, thank you, Lord. You're strengthening my faith. You're cleansing my life. 
You're helping me to walk more in the life of the Spirit. Not that I need to do it to be accepted. Not that I do it because I'm in fear. Not because I need to guarantee that I'm really saved. No. I just want to be like you, Jesus. Being a light to the world, a salt to the earth. I just, I just want to stop right a minute and just say specifically for our church body, what does this mean? We are called to be disciples. What does that mean? It means we're constantly learning and growing in Christ. But it's also that we would call the men in darkness, out of darkness, into light to do the same thing. And here we discover that if we knock on the door and the person receives us, we get to see it. Wow, they were called before the foundations of the world. Now, they might be an Apostle Paul who rejected everybody who talked to him about Jesus, hated him, put him in prison, saw him get stoned to death. But eventually, every one of those seeds that were planted by Stephen when he was being martyred, that affected Paul. That was some deep seeds. And other Christians, no doubt, watered. So when God called Paul, he came. And so we're out there planting seeds, watering seeds, and God giving us the opportunity to harvest. Guys, I can't tell you how many times I've just shared with people, can I read maybe the Romans wrote, or can I read this verse that God gave me today? And they're like, yes, please. In the supermarket, standing in the line at the gas station while the car is getting gas or just feeling led to go walk to the park and just talk to somebody and them going, oh, I need that. I need salvation. I need to get, I need to get it back right with God. I'm a backslidden Christian or I'm somebody that has heard about this, but I didn't know how to get there. It's God's desire that all of us would shake the bush to see who's been called from the foundations of the world. Now, if they hate you and curse you, you just kick the dust off your feet and you go to the next place. Do you guys like Easter egg hunting? It's fun, isn't it? That's what we're doing. We're going out and trying to find the Easter egg. I wonder if there's one behind this door. Well, you got you to open that door to find out. Knock on it and see. Think about you guys before you came to Christ. Somebody dared to get outside their own little world, their own selfish, consumed world with their money and their pains and their house and their family and their bills and their entertainment and their plans. They, they got outside that tornado. I would say as Americans, we are more consumed by ourself so much. We miss out on opportunities that God would use us. But somebody at work, somebody during the lunch hour, somebody who is a neighbor just said, I thought you might want this. Did you get a copy of this? No, I didn't get a copy of that. Oh, let me, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm giving you this. Well, what is it? Well, it just is a Bible verse that's really touched my life. Can I explain that verse and tell you what it means to me? And I, the way to come to Christ is believe that he died for your sins, that he was buried. He rose again the third day. Are you willing to believe in that? Yes then God will give you at this moment the gift of eternal life. He'll write your name in the book of life. You will be with him forever and ever in heaven. Well, what do I do? Just start reading the Bible. Is there anything more? Well, I go to church, you can come with me or not. We're not trying to get people in church here. We're trying to share. You are by nature the light of the world. You are by nature the salt of the earth. Jesus' Holy Spirit is upon you that you might be witnesses, right? I will make you a witness. Every person whom the Holy Spirit comes in is a witness. Do we, do we agree with that? 
And you know what happens when you start sharing the Lord? The fear of it goes away. We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of ticking off our neighbors. <laughs> We're afraid of ticking off people at work. We're afraid of, but isn't that Satan? Just, he's got his claws in them. And you're like taking the claws of Satan and pulling out of them. Of course he's going to puppet them to be mad until they believe. So to those who are not called before the foundations of the world, it's foolishness to them. It's offensive to them. It's a stumbling block to them. But to those who are called before the foundations of the world, it's the wisdom and the power of God. Is the gospel the greatest message you've ever heard? Then there's people who haven't heard it. Or people who have heard it, but they need some water. <laughs> there's some people that heard it, but they've been watered once and they need to get it watered 10 times. And then we have those opportunities where we can pray with them to come to Christ or lead them and hand them a Bible and, and have them start following Christ. So the joy for us here in this season we're in is just to celebrate us and our joy of understanding grace, understanding the blessedness the Father has preordained for us. But more than that, that we would now take and be disciples. You've learned it. Now go into the world and be the light and the salt that God has made you to be. Amen? Lord, we ask that every one of us here that's hearing this, whether streaming or in this building right now, would have the ability, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, to just get outside themselves and their fears and their hurts and their concerns of being rejected and being blackballed as the crazy Christian and all the things that Satan has brainwashed our generation with to keep us Christians quiet. And that, Lord, just in a very natural, loving way, we can talk about you to this lost and dying world. So many people committing suicide right now because of the hopelessness of it. Even without this virus, we know that Satan is on a plan to kill and steal and destroy. So Lord, please help us. Thank you for the joy of this message. And now with joy, not to earn your favor, not because we're afraid of being blackballed, not because we're concerned that you might unaccept us, but just out of the joy of us knowing the truth, the joy that the gospel brings to us, that in that joy we would go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that those who believe could have everlasting life. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.